Okay, we're hot. <laughs> I want to thank the uh, whatever rendition of, of uh, God Bless America was fantastic. You may not know that Irving Berlin was actually an immigrant. Uh, he was from Russia. And he wrote that song uh, to express his appreciation for his adopted company, his adopted country, the United States of America. But uh, I used to coach golf when I, after I retired, I coached golf at West Salem High School for five years. And our head coach, as you can imagine, he had been quite an athlete, had played college golf, and played all the sports in high school. And his son, when he started high school, of course, he wanted him to come out to the golf team, play football and everything. And he had no interest in that. He wanted to be in the band. And uh, so Howie was a little upset about that. He said, ah, really wanted him to be an athlete, and he's in the band. And I said, Howie, let me tell you something. When I flew helicopters in the Army, the Army loved musicians. And if you think about it, think about the hand-eye coordination it takes to play an instrument or to be a vocalist. You have to take direction. You have to be on time. You have to do all these things that are extremely valuable to the military, particularly in aviation. I said, hey, pilots are band geeks. That's who we are. So. <laughs> What's up there, a few pictures. I'm gonna take you on a little journey today. First, I'll tell you a little story. I just got back from Mexico. My wife and I were down in Puerto Vallarta. And the last night we were there, we visited, uh, we went to a, a show, a wonderful show, that required us to take an hour boat ride across the bay. And as I was looking out the back of the boat, watching, I could see the wake of the propellers made. And of course, it was kind of circular, and went around like this, because the captain's dealing with currents, and he's dealing with wind, and he's dealing with tides. So it's not a straight line. It got us to where we needed to go, but it was not a straight line. And that's the theme and the one lesson I want you to take out of my talk today. And that's this. You are never on course. You're just passing through it. You're never on course. You're just passing through it. So I'm going to use a couple examples to, to, and explain that to you later. But... What I'm going to do is take you on a little journey, and it's my journey, and it's to show you where I was when I was the same age as a lot of you in the audience today, uh, 10 years old. Could I have the next slide, please. These are some of the things, by the way, with a high school degree that I did. Now, you had to have a high school degree to go in the Army uh, and fly helicopters, but I accomplished a great deal before I ever got out of the Army and got my college degree. But to do that, obviously, I had some skills. I had some things that I had acquired to allow me to accomplish these things. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So here's where I were, was when I was 10 years old. My parents were divorced. By the way, I was born with, uh, I can't remember the name of the condition, but uh, I didn't walk without braces and corrective shoes until I was 14 years old. My hips were actually out of whack and my feet pointed backwards. So I couldn't play sports, I didn't walk until very late. Um, I was largely unable to participate in any athletes, athletics or normal activities until I got quite a bit older. My parents were divorced. I lived with my aunt after her husband died. Now my aunt was a um, waitress in a boathouse at Low Lake Park in Los Angeles. My wife was a secretary. And I grew up with my brother and my two cousins we grew up in bunk beds in a little tiny room, little tiny house. My mom, in fact, slept on the porch outside. So it was in Los Angeles. So we didn't have a lot of money, but I'll tell you what we had is we had parents who absolutely believed in education. I have a lot of advanced degrees among all my cousins and, and my uh, siblings. Um, none of my aunts went any, anywhere past high school. But the four, they, they, saved and scrimped and sacrificed to send the four boys to Catholic school. Now I started to school a year early because here's the first person who had a great influence on my life. My grandmother used to read to me every day. Every day she sat me down and it was the most precious time of the day for me is she would sit down and read to me. So when I was four years old, of course, I was curious as to what those things actually meant on that page and she would continually explain, and I learned to read over time. So when I was five years old, they decided it was time for me to go to school. So I actually graduated from high school a year early. I was a year behind every, everyone else from an age standpoint. But that is one of the most valuable gifts I was ever given, was love to read. And I still love to read. 
Uh, let me promise you, I said this once at a, at a uh, school in Washington, D.C. when I was at the Pentagon, and I said, they were fourth graders, and I said, if you think when you graduate from high school, you graduate from college, you're done learning, I'm sorry, I've got, a, I've got a, a, uh, some bad news for you. It's actually good news. You're going to learn all your life. So the question is, that's where I was when I was 10 years old. Get the next slide, please. So how did I get from there to here? Now that upper left picture is me at the Colosseum in Rome. I am 21 years old and I'm a member of the Presidential Flight Detachment. I'm a member of the pres Presidential Party. Uh, President Nixon came over right after he was inaugurated and of course visited all the NATO countries. And one of the things he was gonna do was to go to the Vatican and have a visit with the Pope. So it was my job, to, I was the lead pilot, I flew some of the staff, and was the first helicopter ever land in the Piazza of St. Peter's. How did I go from a kind of disabled, not very bright, really, I didn't think so, 10-year-old um, from divorced parents who were poor, and 21, I'm doing that. So that's the journey we're going to take. won't take long, but I promise you there's some good lessons there. Now, I wasn't a very good student in high school. I didn't think I was very bright. I was really bad at math. I was really bad at science, you know, all the STEM stuff. I was pretty good at English. Not so good. Very underperforming is, is how, I, how I would categorize it. But something happened to me between my junior and senior year that made a huge difference. And what happened was this. I was playing summer ball. Baseball was about the only sport that I was fairly good at. And it's because it didn't require as much athletic ability as some of the other sports. You know, I could do little things that make me valuable as a coach. I could hit behind the runner. I had a really good eye, good hand-eye co coordination, uh, sacrifice spot. I did all the little things that made me valuable without really being a star. And then, while as I was playing summer ball, the Santa Clara coach came up to me and approached me, introduced himself, and he said, you know, Mike, he said, I can't offer you a scholarship, but if you go to Santa Clara, I'd love to have you walk on. Boy. Think of that. I thought I was kind of a average, maybe a little above average high school athlete, and all of a sudden I have a college coach saying, hey, you might have a chance to come play for me. Well, all of a sudden the light went on, and I said, well, if I'm going to go to Santa Clara, that's a very high-rated school, first I've got to be able to get in, right? First I've got to get my grades to the point where I can go and compete for a spot at that university. And then the other thing it did is it said, you know what, maybe I'm better than I think I am at some other things. And so I started to look at my weaknesses, and one of them I was very shy. I, did, I would never have gotten up in front of people in high school and talked to them. And so I said, I'd better take speech and debate and learn how to do that. And I did. And then the third thing that happened to me was right before I graduated, and uh, her name was Mrs. Bunting, she was my English teacher, I took what you would call now advanced placement AP. Um, and the final exam was interesting. She, she wrote three phrases on the board, and she said, take one of these, and then take three of the novels that we've written this year, and argue that point, which, whatever you're gonna argue. Well, of course, I'm a debater, I'm going, I can do that. And uh, we had 50 minutes to do it. There's no computers, we're hand, you know, handwriting it. And uh, she's gonna judge us on punctuation, spelling, all that kind of stuff. 60 possible points, I got 64. She gave me five point bonus for my argument and took a point off for a punctuation mistake I made. <laughs> so now I found out I could write. Boy, what a difference that made. And believe me, I've been writing ever since. And a lot of what I did at the Pentagon was research and writing. So those lessons were key for me. So, um, after a year in college, the Vietnam War was going on, and I decided, well, I'm going to go in the Army. I don't want to walk, so it's a lot better to fly, I think. So what did I need to do? Well, I had to pass the um, entrance exam in the Army, and I had to score five points higher than it took to go to West Point. Think of that. Now, I had a psychologist tell me later, and he said, that was by design, he said, because we put more pressure in nine months of your training than we do on four years of West Point, because 100% of you are going to Vietnam. So we got to know that you're capable of doing that. So 
So, slide please. So what did I learn in flight school? And the top one there is absolutely, I think, key for anybody. They told us very early, they said, cooperate and graduate. Cooperate and graduate. And what they meant was that each one of you is going to have certain strengths, each one of you is going to have certain weaknesses. And you need to team up so that all of you get through this program. Now, I was kind of weak on, weak on aerodynamics and that sort of thing, so there were guys who were sharp on that who helped me. They were weak on other planes. I helped them. So cooperate and graduate. You'll find your classmates, if you're having difficulty in a certain class, you've got talent in that class you can draw on. So I graduated successfully. I was 26 out of 298, I think, something like that. Uh, and off I go to Vietnam. Now, what did I learn in Vietnam? Next slide, please. Well, dodging bullets, that was important. But there were some key lessons that I learned there. And one of them is, you know what? You better learn from the mistakes of others because you won't have enough time to make them all yourself and make corrections. So you've got to be a good observer. You've got to see what other people do and learn from your mistakes. A lot of you think when you see movies and television and you say, well, there's a hero. He's not afraid. Uh, trust me, he is. Um, fear is normal. And when you see somebody do a heroic act of, of some kind, whether it's a police officer, a fireman, whoever it may be, they're just as frightened as you could imagine they could be. But they do what they do in spite of their fear. That's the key. They do what they do in spite of their fear. So if you're nervous when you're going to be in front of somebody, or you're nervous getting ready to take a test, or you're nervous getting ready to uh, compete in a sport, that's normal. Absolutely normal. One of the greatest basketball players of all time, Bill Russell, he won 10 world championships, I think. And when he was physically sick before a game, his coach knew they would win. Red Arbeck, he said, oh, Russell's sick, we're winning. Because it was that fear. See, he cared. He cared so much it made him physically sick. So don't ever think that heroes aren't scared, because they are. They're just as scared as anyone else. But they do what they do in spite of their fear. Slide, please. And here are some of the other things that I learned. Uh, the bottom one there is real key. Leaders are readers. And readers are leaders. Uh, you can't be a leader without uh, constantly upgrading your knowledge, constantly upgrading your skills. Readers are leaders. Learn to love to read, and uh, that will take you through life. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so those are some of the lessons on how I got to where I was. And now we're going to go into my later life. Of... Okay, this is a picture of Kandahar. I was down there in 2003. I was actually downtown in a rug shopping. Um, I've got some beautiful Afghan rugs. Uh, I also am probably the only person you know who has an Afghan rug that was a gift from an Afghan warlord. It's a long story, but I do have it. Uh, and my question here is, when you look at this picture, is what do you think these folks are doing? What do you think is going on in downtown Kandahar when I took this picture? People are shopping. Children are going to school. Uh, Activities you would see in any town, anywhere across the world. Next slide, please. Now, this is Vietnam in 1968. What's going on here? Pretty much the same thing, right? People are shopping, children are going to school, and uh, trying to carry on uh, with their normal lives. And that's really the world, folks. What you see in Salem is what's going on in nearly every town every village, everywhere across the world. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a lunch we had. Every week we went out uh, with the, the gentleman on the right is General Sharzai. Uh, he's uh, uh, an Afghan warlord. He used to show us eight millimeter um, movies of him fighting the Russians in the 1980s. Uh, but a very interesting guy. We used to go out to his house once a week. You can't really this, see the slide very well, but what you would see on the plate is uh, chicken and some Afghan flatbread, and tomatoes, and cucumbers, and all the stuff that you have at home when you dine, uh, and very similar. Next slide, please. And this was a lot of fun. Uh, this was General Sharzai's brother, who was the governor of uh, uh, Kandahar province, 
And he had gone to Mecca for the Hajj. That's one of the five pillars of Islam. You make a pilgrimage to uh, Mecca. And um, he had come back and we had a big celebration for him and so I was there to greet him. So it was really fun for me to be part of the culture when I was working down there. Next slide, please. Okay, so the point of my showing you these slides is that, you know, we focus so much on differences. We look at other cultures, we look at other races, we look at other religions, and we focus on differences. And I promise you, if you did a study of all the major religions in the world, and you did a study on all the major cultures in the world, you would find more similarities than you would differences. So why do we focus so much on the differences? Because in my travels, I've seen so much more similarities. And what I used to tell when I go to uh, high schools and talk is that you may look at a tribal dance in Sub-Saharan Africa and say, gosh, that's weird, you know. They're celebrating a wedding and look at the weird dances and everything else. And if I had those people look at how you act at a concert of the latest teen idol, they would say, oh, that's pretty weird. You know, show them a mosh pit, see what they would think about that, right? Uh, it's, and, and that is one of my points, is that you celebrate the same things in a little different matter, a different way, and then you focus on the differences when in fact they're the same thing, just a different form of celebration. Okay, does that make sense? This was a point I made at the outset of my talk this morning, and that is that you're never actually on course, you're just passing through it. Now here's what I mean. If I was flying a helicopter, say from Salem to Seattle, I would take a map out and I would draw a line and that's my course. Now if you were, say, I, and then I, I went and flew it, if you were, say, a couple thousand feet above me and you watched my course, you would only see me intersect that course periodically because it would look like this. Why there's wind up there, there's currents, there's all kinds of things affecting my path. So I am consistently going off course and then correcting back on course. Now I'm still gonna get to where I intend, but it's not gonna be a straight line. Now what does that mean as far as you're concerned? Well, as you can see my little journey there I had some physical disabilities, I had confidence issues, I came from a broken home. All these things you would say, gosh, that's a disadvantage, but I wound up flying for the President of the United States. Now, how did I get there? Well, I guarantee you, it wasn't a straight line, and that's my point. It's never a straight line. And no matter what you're doing, whether it's your schoolwork, your family, your religion, your relationship to your siblings, your relationship to your parents, whatever it may be, you're gonna constantly drift off course. Now the key is, and the key, the, the reason those people are there to help you is that when you're real young, they're gonna correct you. And they're gonna say, oh, you're drifting, you gotta get back on course. Now the older and more experienced you get, you're gonna say, oh, I'm drifting off course because now I've learned all those lessons, okay? But don't think it's abnormal that you're not where you want to be right at that moment. That's normal. What you need to do is recognize, oh, okay, I gotta get back on course. That's the key. Okay, one final story, story and then I'll open it for questions. Um, when I was in Africa, I had a chance to go down to a place called Manda Bay. It was in Kenya. And I had a bunch of Navy SEALs who had this bay. They were doing some training, um, anti-piracy stuff and that kind of thing. But you know, when you put a camp into uh, Africa, uh, there are animals and critter, critters who live there and they don't care that you put a fence there and you put a building there. If they're used to wandering north to south through that area, they're wandering north to south right through your camp. And that's what happened. They had a baboon tribe that lived in the area and they just right through the fence, right through the camp, right? Just like it wasn't there. So the camp commander got this bright idea. I'll get a dog. So he got a dog. He was a big, mean dog. And he said, this dog is gonna keep those baboons squared away. Get them out of the camp. So I have pictures of Bob's, that was his name, Bob the dog. I have pictures of Bob's first foray out to confront the baboons. You see him walking out, he goes right up to the alpha male 
and rolls over on his back and lets the alpha male start to groom him. You know how <laughs> apes do that, right? That's cultural adaptation right there. He realized, have you seen the fangs on a baboon? Yeah, Bob saw them too. So, Bob recognized right there, this confrontation thing is off course. I gotta get back on course. Back on course says, I adapt to this guy. Okay. Well, that concludes my presentation. And if you have any questions for me, I certainly welcome them.